it's a pleasure to have you here and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Sean, um, and I really appreciate you including me in this Leadership Day. Um, like Danielle, I'm very honored to spend um, some time with your audience this morning. Um, my presentation today will really focus on the work that APHL has been doing to empower the nation's biosafety professionals. Um, we, beyond the work that we do with public health laboratories, APHL spends a substantial amount of time collaborating with others, so other partner organizations, other clinical laboratories to strengthen biosafety. And so I'd like to share a little bit about that work and also my experiences and my approach to engage in others um, to accomplish a shared goal. Sean, next slide, please. Sean, can we have the next slide, please? I'm seeing it on my end, Chris. I'm sorry. I have outline showing right now. There we go. Sorry, I think there's a, a slight delay. Apologies for that. Um, so the outline of the presentation today, as I mentioned, will be to share a bit about APHL, our approach to engage in others to strengthen biosafety, and then a look ahead at what we see are some of the important aspects of, of the workforce, if you will. Next slide, please. So in any presentation, I've, I've got to do my due diligence and share a bit about um, APHL. Uh, we are a national organization that really focuses on strengthening laboratory systems. And um, much of our membership is domestic, but we also work globally and assist many countries with developing strategic plans, strengthening laboratory safety with the overall goal of improving the public health laboratory system and practice. Next slide, please. So more about the Association of Public Health Laboratories or APHL. Next slide, please. Sean, I think you're going backwards. One more back. Oh, sorry. So I'm going, you know, my, do I need to go backwards, Chris? I'm sorry. I apologize. Yes, um, we should be on slide, um, I believe slide five, slide four. Okay, I apologize. I think vision and mission. We're finished with that one. Okay. Next slide. What is APHL? Yes, correct. There we go. Sorry about that. Sure, thank you. Um, so we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization with over a thousand members from state and local public health laboratories, um, as well as environmental and agricultural laboratories. We do have individual members from a number of federal agencies and academic institutions. An important distinction here, I mentioned that we're engaged internationally as well, International laboratories, that institution, is not a member of APHL, but the individuals can certainly be members. Um, one of our big picture goals is really, to, for, is really to advocate for laboratory funding to really address critical lab issues. And beyond funding, we also um, work collaboratively with various federal agencies and partners to look at how we can strengthen lab systems, whether that's implementing new technologies or evaluating new technologies for later implementation in public health and other laboratories. Um, APHL was really founded as a training organization. We provide training and best practices for public health laboratories um, and also clinical laboratories. Next slide, please. So last year, we spent some time really thinking through what will the next two to three years look like for APHL? And um, one of the things that we focused on was how do we lead public health laboratories in the, into the post-pandemic era? So at some point, we expect COVID to end. What are the lessons that we've learned from COVID? How do we utilize that going forward? And some of the things that we really talked about here is the transformation of the public health lab systems. How do we look at rebuilding a, a, a public health laboratory system that's capable 
of flexibility and adaptability to respond to whatever the threat may be. What you're looking at here is our um, strategic map for the next two years. At the core of that strategic map is really advocacy and partnerships to transform the public health lab system. It's also um, an opportunity for us to look at the public health laboratory workforce. What do we need to do there to recruit and re retain the next generation of leaders? Um, and then also, um, what, are, what are the system issues that exist that, can, that really need to be addressed and strengthened to be able to respond to that future threat? One of the things I wanna point out here is that while it's not specifically called out, at the core of this work is really looking at safer and secure facilities it's also looking at the workforce from a perspective of not just your scientific capabilities, but the, the workforce that is well versed in safety and um, has, has sort of those critical thinking skills to lead us it for, um, into the, into the post-pandemic era. Next slide, please. So getting into some more biosafety specifics, um, APHL has always been involved in, in safety, whether that's through strengthening quality management systems or providing training courses to laboratorians globally. Um, we have always been in that safety or biosafety space, if you will. Um, 2014 is when we were, I want to say, thrusted further into biosafety leadership. And what really happened in that 2014-2015 space was we saw, I think, close to 30,000 Ebola cases globally with almost a 40% fatality rate. In the U.S., we only saw four cases and um, one death from Ebola, but that was enough to really get the attention of senior leaders that we've got some significant gaps in safety here at all levels. How do we address those gaps? And one of the things we saw, which we, we see typically in any response, is an influx of funding. Um, so in 2014, APHL applied for and received funding to really help our laboratories as well as clinical laboratories strengthen their safety systems. Um, we essentially had two overarching objectives, serve as a subject matter expert, where we would provide guidance and support to public health laboratories, and then also coordinate national efforts to improve biosafety in public health labs and support outreach to clinical laboratories. Those were two hefty um, objectives or, or big picture goals, if you will. And I'd like to say that APHL rose to that, rose to that challenge. Next slide, please. So I want to go back to some of the basics. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot today about different strategies and different leadership tools. One of our approaches at APHL is very simple. Sort of let's let's sort of take back, take a look at what what the challenge is, and then ha have that big picture. What's your vision? How do we plan to address that challenge? How, how do we get there? Um, who would be ideal to help us address that challenge? One of the first things that we do across the organization and as leaders is really not assume that you have all of the skills to solve all problems. There may be times when you need to engage others to really assist you with meeting whatever that big picture goal is. Um, the other parts of it, um, we, we really want to make sure that others perceive the organization in a positive light. So um, for us, that means making sure that we are knowledgeable. We are indeed an expert in that field. We are credible. They believe the information that we're sharing. And we are, we are also helpful. The tools that we're providing will help laboratorians do a better job in their day to day work. It's also critical for us from a leadership perspective to engage many partners, to have the diversity of experiences, diversity of ex expertise to solve a common goal. And at the core of everything, coming back to our vision and mission is making sure that we remain committed to quality, science and lab practice. Next slide, please.
So as I mentioned, one of our goals um, as part of this Ebola response and being thrusted into that biosafety limelight was to be the subject matter expert, if you will, and recognizing that we don't have that experience um, within our staff. We have some experience, but we're certainly not practicing laboratory science. We are now working at a desk. So how do we get the folks that are practicing involved? Um, we quickly formed a biosafety and biosecurity committee um, who were knowledgeable and really had that expertise to be credible subject matter experts. Um, we also established what was called a partners forum. And, you know, I sort of translate this to where within laboratories or your respected, uh, respective facilities, you may want to look at different types of committees where you bring in diverse folks and have you have expertise coming in from you know private sector public sectors and you're you're working together to, sort of towards addressing your biosafety challenges we also established various communities and training programs and i hope that many of you in here um, are familiar with those programs I'll, I'll briefly mention them but we can certainly share more details um, Michael Marsico um, heads up our program where he's involved in developing these training programs and he can certainly provide more information on those. Next slide, please. So here, here are some of the, the tools that we utilized. Um, we utilized what we call a, a forum for biosafety professionals. There are two of those forums. And the goal there is to really have have a communications platform where biosafety professionals can talk to each other in an environment that is safe. You can really share um, having this particular challenge, how would you solve it? And people share their ideas for solving those issues. Um, we also created a peer network program, which is at the core a twinning program that peers laboratories together. Here, they can learn from each other. And I, I hope you're seeing a common theme in my discussion here, which is really leveraging the expertise of others, not assuming that we have all of the answers. And that ability to learn from each other, I think it's what makes our program stronger um, and also credible. You've, you've gained expertise from others and you've now implemented that. Um, in addition to our peer network, we partnered with Sean Kaufman and um, Safer Behaviors to implement the BioSafe 360 Leadership Program. That has been running now since 2016. And here is where we go beyond sort of that technical space and look at your critical thinking skills, look at your behaviors. How does that impact laboratory safety? What can you do? What are you in control of? And how do you get buy-in from your community uh, of laboratorians? Um, and then we've held several leadership development workshops and technical course, technical training courses. Sean has been very generous with his time and assisted with some of those leadership development workshops as well. Next slide, please. So a few things I want to you know, touch on today is that as you lead biosafety programs, my recommendation is to utilize various is to utilize various leadership skills and, and styles. I don't think that one particular style or sort of stick into that one style or one approach is going to be beneficial. Looking at how you can sort of draw from different leaders and skill sets will be critical. Um, to get buy-in from your teams and to have a successful program. One of the things um, I, I like to do is really look at how you can motivate or inspire others. And so the idea of you encourage folks to really think through a problem and then come up with innovative solutions. Another approach is the idea of engaging others. Um, it's something that we do on a continuous basis here at APHL, but it's, it's critical that all of your laboratory scientists um, that you're working with know that they have a voice. They can work with you to solve a particular problem. Um, and something else that I, I like to do is, is to utilize what we call sort of team profiles. Understand the behaviors of others and how you can shape or change those behaviors. You wanna look at how you leverage the strengths of the, the folks around you 
And so maybe you're having a difficult time with one particular person, but there's another person who's able to communicate well or engage that person, perhaps looking at how you leverage um, the skills of, of that other individual to help you solve that problem would be a good approach. Um, there are also some styles where it's value based. If you share what your value is, what's important to you, what's your, you know, your big picture outcome, where, where do you want to go? You can also get buy in from folks who are committed to those shared core values. Next slide, please. Another important leadership tool um, that I utilize and many of us at APHL utilize, it's communications. Being able to really share your stories, it's a powerful tool where you're able to engage your lab team, recognize and share their successes. And here I've provided you with three avenues where we are happy to also help tell your stories and share those successes. Um, you can always connect with us online or um, my contact information is also included in this presentation. We are happy to tell those stories. Um, and more importantly, it's not just about telling the story, it's about sharing the successes of your teammates as well. Um, next slide, please. So I started out by telling you briefly or discussing briefly APHL's vision and I, I want to sort of conclude in that same lines where for us, we're always looking ahead and thinking of, you know, what's that end goal. And for us, it's an empowered lab workforce where you can safely utilize the best technology to respond to whatever the threat may be. And how we accomplish that can be continuous training and partnerships with others. Ongoing advocacy, we find that um, many policymakers may um, change over time or they may have short term memories. You've got to continue that advocacy work, continue your communications effort, always, always share what you're doing and then build that community, share resources that you've utilized that you may, that may be helpful, but share it with your community as well. Next slide. And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't share this information with you all here today. Um, these are two key dates that are um, one we've already started. It's our newborn screening and genetics testing symposium. Um, if you're interested, um, you can certainly visit our website, APHL.org, to learn more information. And then our annual conference is coming up next year. I'd like to encourage you all to take a look at that. If you're interested in presenting or attending, please um, you know, follow follow the the information that's online, and you're most welcome to reach out to myself or Michael Marsico. Um, Sean, I'd like to go ahead and um, conclude today and open it up for any questions folks may have in terms of what we're doing at APHL or any of the items that I touched on today. Thank you. Outstanding, Chris. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for being a part of APHL. I thank Mike and Scott for us and all the staff there. And ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Chris, uh, Chris got time for two questions. We're going to take two questions. So if you can put Chris in front of uh, your chat box, or if you want to raise your hand, that sometimes is the quicker uh, way, way to do that. You could, I will open your mic, and uh, we will take questions from the audience that way too. So that's up to you. Any any questions before we move on to our next speaker, uh, Dana Perkins? So Dana, get ready. You're next. Any questions? Comments, thoughts. Chris, a lot of, uh, yeah, you see it in the chat box. Well done. Very good. Very good. I'm not seeing any hands go up. Chris, you may have wowed the audience. You may have wowed <laughs> them in, in, into, into silence. Come on, folks. There we go. Just a lot of thank yous. You're seeing that. Yeah, clap, clap. Yep, let's light it up. Remember, guys, let's light it up.